Facebook and then go ahead and get started. All right, hi everybody, welcome. My name is Destiny Dunbar and I'm the Community Engagement Specialist for Resources. Um, and thank you for joining us for another one of our North Sound Stewards speaker series. Um, for anybody who may not be a part of North Sound Stewards, that is a joint project between resources and the Whatcom Marine Resource Committee. And together we kind of come together and train Whatcom County residents to um, become beach survey volunteers and collect data on our shorelines and things that are relevant to like our water quality and things like that. So today we're going to be hearing from Nam Sue from the Department of Fish and Wildlife and he is going to be giving us an overview um, of the ecology of seagrasses, seaweeds, and kelps off of Washington's coast. And we got some more people joining, okay. Um, but first, just a couple of reminders, these presentations are recorded. So if you don't want to be um, on the recording, you're welcome to keep your camera off. Um, these are all going to be posted to the Resources North Sound Stewards YouTube page. So if you miss anything, um, you're welcome to go back and check that out. Um, go ahead and make sure that you are muted unless you're asking a question, um, just so we don't pick up on any background noise. Um, and if you have any questions, go ahead and type them in the chat and we will go ahead and answer them. I don't know, Nam, if you want to answer them as they come or like if you want to stop for questions at certain points, but I will give you those questions when they come in. I like to uh, do them as they come because okay, they right, might think perfect. about what I'm presenting on at the time, so that's fine. All right, well, Nam has a lot of good information for us, so I'm going to go ahead, turn off my um, video here and read Nam's bio, and then we'll go ahead and get started. Okay, so Nam Sue is the Washington Department of Fish and Wildlife Area Habitat Biologist, protecting fish and wildlife habitats in North Kitsap in eastern Jefferson counties. He implements state laws to regulate land use and construction activities that may impact the waters of the state, reviews forestry activities in or near streams, and reviews and comments on local government critical area and shoreline permitting processes, as well as working with other agencies and nonprofits to plan and facilitate restoration projects. Before working for Fish and Wild Wildlife, Nam was an environmental consultant and scientific diver specializing in subaquatic vegetation surveys, and he also worked several seasons as a science manager aboard the research vessel Nautilus, conducting deep sea mapping and research using remotely operated submersives for the Ocean Exploration Trust. Nam is a marine biologist and oceanographer by training. However, at heart, Nam is a naturalist, curious about all things in nature, and especially fond of marine vegetation like seagrasses, seaweeds, and kelps. All right, thank you so much, Nam. I'm going to go ahead and pass it off to you. Perfect. Thank you, Destiny. I appreciate that. Uh, great intro. Uh, I wonder if anybody caught my pun about being fond of vegetation. <laughs> um, and so I'm going to go ahead and try to share my screen. Bear with me with one one second um and if someone would just let me know if they are seeing my presentation i would really appreciate it perfect i see a thumbs up great well thank you for joining me this afternoon everybody uh you're basically going to learn from me uh everything you want to know about submerged aquatic vegetation of the salish sea and then maybe some things that you didn't know that you wanted to know about this uh, well, I really uh, appreciate that great intro. Here are some pictures of me doing some of the things that Destiny mentioned. I won't really go into who I am besides the fact that I'm a big nerd for uh, seaweed, kelp, and seagrasses. Uh, this is this presentation, and I really appreciate North Sound Stewards inviting me to provide this presentation. This is somewhat of a special uh, little home, homecoming for me since I did live in uh, Bellingham for, for several years while I attended grad school at Western. So very happy to be talking to folks from North Sound there. Uh, I'm going to jump right in because I have a long presentation uh, with lots of great uh, visuals and, and cool science facts to share with you all, and I only have an hour, so I'm going to try to cram it in. If I do speak a little fast, or if there's anything I say that you don't understand, please feel free, uh, feel free to stop me and, and ask me to repeat myself or ask any questions throughout my presentation. So with that, I'm going to jump right in and sit, ask, what is submerged aquatic vegetation? Um, that's kind of a rhetorical question. It's in the name. These are vegetation that are submerged. And primarily in our region, this uh, encompasses two groups, and these are the seagrasses and uh, macroalgae, uh, which within that, we have kelp and seaweeds. Uh, this is a nice photo I took uh, out here where I currently live in Port Townsend area that shows at a low tide both seagrasses, especially here eelgrass, uh, living alongside kelp, which is very unique. I'm going to dive right in on seagrass and, uh, and, then, and, and then switch over to talk more about macroalgae, kelp, and sea, seaweeds. 
Um, so in Washington state, we have several species of seagrasses uh, that can be broken up into two general group. We have what's known uh, as the surf grass of which there are three species. Uh, don't try to get me to name all three species because they're somewhat um, uh, hard to identify and whatnot. And most of our surf grass is out on the coast. Uh, but more importantly, within our Puget Sound area, within the Salish Sea and in the North Sound area, we have abundance of eelgrass. Uh, and within this group of eelgrass, we have both the Pacific native eelgrass as well as the dwarf uh, Japanese eelgrass, which is uh, an invasive species here from Asia. Uh, seagrasses are true plants, uh, which means that they are vascularized. Uh, they have true vascularization, such as folium xylem, that's responsible for transporting liquids, gases within their, uh, within their bodies. Uh, they produce flowers and they have true roots. So all of the structures in their anatomy is highly specialized and evolved. And, and one really interesting fact about seagrass is that this is a ev evolutionarily, this is a land plant that returned back to the ocean, uh, very similar to that of, or analogous to marine mammals where you know, they were derived from a group of organisms that left the ocean. Uh, you know, in this case, they were derived from algae that came to land and became true plants, uh, evolved uh, reproductive methods such as flowering, colonization, whatnot, that only can take place on land, but then uh, due to, you know, ecological pressures, they uh, move back into the ocean. So very interesting group of plants here. I'm going to keep going on and talk about their morphology. Again, as I mentioned, they're vascularized. They have specialized structures, uh, such as the roots, uh, and they produce these runner roots. And for, for anybody in the audience that's from the South, uh, you know, I've spent time in, in Florida, you might be familiar with St. Augustine grass. Uh, these are, you know, you know, turf or lawn grass that uh, reproduce or spread with these runner roots. Um, and so you see that a lot. Um, in seagrasses, they produce this rhizosphere or a thick mat of roots under the surface where they share a lot of nutrients and, and can, can propagate uh, asexually this way. Um, they have turions or shoots and, and their leaves are what we call blades. Uh, within these seagrasses, they, um, they're, they're highly diverse and they can live in various environments. Uh, they live in both sandy and rocky substrate. Uh, though I, I will mention that typically our eelgrass live in sandy substrate and our surf grass uh, live in rocky substrate. As you can imagine by the name surf grass, they, they typically live in high energy areas, which uh, have a lot of energy that scours away the sand and leaves a rocky substrate. Uh, these plants are highly plastic in their morphology. What that means is that there is a high degree of variation in, in how they grow depending on environmental factors. Uh, in my time doing surveys on eelgrass in their water, I've seen um, I've seen eelgrass that are you know a few inches tall um, and a few and maybe half an inch wide in highly stressed environments to eelgrass forests where I've dove in the eelgrass forests uh, where the blades are literally six to eight feet long and and they are about an inch and a half to two inch wide and more sheltered and, and ideal growing conditions. So again, these plants are highly plastic. They can, uh, they can adapt their morphology uh, uh, to various environmental conditions, which is really interesting. Uh, as far as their life history goes, these are perennial uh, plants every winter uh, with less sunlight and, 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 uh, and increased storms, they tend to die back, but their root system, that rhizosphere is still in, in the subsurface. And, you know, in more protective bay, bays, they still exhibit or show their, their turions and blades above the surface. So they are there year round. However, they're highly seasonal. So the, the peak of their growing season is typically between June to October. Um, and that's when you're gonna see their uh, greatest distribution. Uh, and although that distribution shrinks down in the winter, their general, you know, rhizomat is still there. Um, but again, they can they can acclimate and adapt to various factors, and and because they live in a shallow intertidal, um, there is a lot there are a lot of geological processes at work, uh, sediment uh, erosion and accretion that causes these eelgrass beds to change where they are located uh, as far as their very uh, distribution. Uh, as well as their density, depending on interannual, you know, 
uh, conditions, oceanic conditions. Um, they reproduce again through, through flowering. And you see this in one of the photos I've taken here on the bottom. These are what uh, eelgrass flowers look like. And in this photo, if you can see it, you'll see individual seed pods in, in this one uh, blade or sleeve of a blade. Um, but for the most part, they, they grow vegetatively or asexually through that runner root system. Uh, but there are areas in the sound where, where they have been observed to, to flower and reproduce sexually. So going right into the two different kinds of seagrass we have, I will talk real quickly about surf grass. Uh, their genus is Phyllospadex. Um, again, there are three different species, which I'm not going to focus on because they're, they're, they're somewhat hard to identify and find. Phyllospadex, again, is a surf grass that specializes in grown and high energy areas on rocky substrates. Um, I really wish I had a photo to show you all of, of a highly specialized root system they have, uh, in which uh, they have these, they have these uh, features components on the root system called uh, sand socks. It basically is, is a, a lot of little fine roots that they use to trap sand and inflate into, into basically analogous to holdfasts. Uh, they use these sand socks to, to stuff their, their roots um, along with the sand that's trapped in the roots into the crevices and cracks in these rocks, and that's how they hold on to these, these really hard substrates, rocky uh, coastlines. So really interesting. Um, maybe one day I'll get, get a photo of that and add it to this presentation. Um, moving away from surf grass or the phyllospadex um, seagrass, we're, I'm gonna talk about our native Pacific eelgrass here, Zostera marina. This is the one that gets a lot of attention in the sound. This is the uh, most widespread, I would say, uh, seagrass throughout Washington. Um, and this uh, native Pacific eelgrass, Oster Marana, is typically found in soft substrate, um, sandy to maybe muddy, but typically sandy bottoms. And here you see it um, both inundated and um, at high tide and out of the water at low tide. Compare that to the invasive dwarf Japanese eelgrass here. And here is a, a figure on the upper right that is a great comparison of the two, uh, where you can see that the dwarf eelgrass is significantly smaller than, than the native disaster marina. But one thing I will caution you against is, is making uh, identification based on the size. Um, you know, like I mentioned, these seagrasses are highly plastic and they, they change their morphology due to environmental factors. So I can tell you that I have seen native eelgrass, Zostera marana, that looks small in highly stressed environments like the Japanese uh, eelgrass. Um, so I wouldn't use the size of the blades as an ident identifying feature. There are typically, um, there's a few uh, more conclusive identifying features you can use in its rhizome and in the sleeve of the Turian, which really requires a trained eye to look at. Um, but to share the difference, I, I really hope that this video works. This is a video I took, and you can see right here in the foreground, Zoster japonica, right next to a patch of Zoster marina, just kind of comparing the size difference between the two. So again, swimming through now from Zoster marina to Zoster uh, japonica. Can I get some kind of thumbs up if, if you are seeing the video? Yes, awesome. Hopefully that's coming through nice and clear. Switching slides. Real quickly, I'm going to talk about eelgrass, and I put an asterisk here because this is talking strictly about eelgrass, not surf grass, and all, all of the seagrass in Washington State, Washington State. I'm specifically talking about eelgrass and their status, trends, and distribution. This is a map from Washington Department of Ecology. You can find it at this link, which I'm happy to share afterwards. That shows um, the documented uh, locations of eelgrass throughout Washington State. Uh, one thing you'll notice is that there is an absence of eelgrass along the Strait of Juan de Fuca on, and along the north coast. That's typically because it's way too high energy and these are rocky shorelines. Uh, and so where you see the green where there is eelgrass, th these are areas that we you can assume is sandy bottom areas. And as you can see, there is quite a bit in the North Sound area on the other side of, of Lummi here. Um, and there, there is actually quite a bit in um, 
in Bellingham Bay. I, I know for a fact there was some eelgrass restoration projects that's occurred uh, off of, um, gee, what's that park there in, in, in Fairhaven? Uh, anyways, there's, there's eelgrass in Bellingham Bay. Um, although some of the inputs from the Nooksack, you know, causing, causing changes to, to turbidity and, and a, amount of sunlight getting to the bottom could, could be impacting, you know, where eelgrass is in the inner bay there. <clears throat> so real quickly, threats to eelgrass, um, you know, like any other submerged aquatic vegetation, they're threatened by development throughout the sound. You know, this could be as simple as someone building a dock over them to shade them out or um, other types of development that's causing increased uh, turbidity and sedimentation into our near shore that might be smothering, uh, smothering these plants out. Uh, these, there, there's still a lot of research going on with regards to climate change and ocean acidification. What's interesting is that a lot of the research uh, not, are not only focusing on the effects of elevated ocean temperatures and ocean acidity on eelgrass, but the research is also looking at the ameliorating effects of eelgrass or how, how this one plant that sequesters carbon can be used to store carbon and, and help, uh, help with the climate change and ocean acidification situation. I'm going to talk about that a little bit later. Uh, if you ask me, it's my opinion that the greatest threat to eelgrass in the Salish Sea is nutrients. Uh, we are a relatively enclosed water body, an enclosed basin, and there is a lot of population around the Salish Sea, and we are dumping a lot of nutrients directly into our sound. Although it might be treated, there it's still, you know, still nutrients into our sound. Um, and so this causes uh, epiphytes, you can see on this picture here, uh, it causes other seaweeds or more nuisance weeds to grow on the surface of these eelgrass competing with them for sunlight. Uh, but there also is actually research that shows that uh, eelgrass being a true plant gets burnt by nutrients, just like if you were to fertilize or over fertilize your house plants, they get burnt. Uh, increasing temperature could result in increased diseases. And as I mentioned, there are other invasive, you know, uh, invasive plants that can compete with them for space. One thing that I will note at this point that I should have said earlier is the dwarf Japanese eelgrass, although it's an invasive plants, invasive sum submerged aquatic vegetation, um, it doesn't ex it doesn't directly compete with the native eelgrass because they uh, the Japanese eelgrass tend to uh, exist in shallower areas. So they're because of the difference in habitat, they don't quite overlap and they don't quite uh, compete with each other. And frankly, if you ask me, um, I think the dwarf Japanese eelgrass fulfills or, or functions and provide, fulfills or provides functions as an important uh, vegetation in the upper inner tidal word on native eelgrass don't grow. Um, so, you know, I, I'll just point out that in, definition of non non native or invasive species those are always you know up for interpretation depending on who you are and, and the ecological impacts of functions of the species uh, there because of the various threats to eelgrass and I will say that eelgrass is in decline throughout the Salish Sea there's a lot of effort to uh, restore eelgrass I fortunately uh, uh, was I was lucky enough to participate in some of this eelgrass restoration. These are actually pictures of mine, of me doing some eelgrass plantings. Uh, so for, for two years, I was subcontracted with Department of Natural Resource, um, basically as an underwater gardener, where I took uh, the sod plugs of eelgrass from healthy donor beds and plant them underwater in areas that, you know, uh, you know much smarter than people than myself have modeled as ideal habitats for, for eelgrass. And here is a picture of one of the finished products. This is at Joemma State Park down on the Key Peninsula. And I can tell you that these patches are significantly larger now. This is the most successful transplant site and that um, it has grown hundreds of percent. Um, so great stuff going on in the state by a lot of people out there to restore your grass. And with that, I'm gonna uh, switch gears and talk about macroalgae. Um, so putting seagrasses aside, we're gonna address macroalgae, which uh, in, encompasses seaweeds and uh, kelp. Uh, what's really interesting about the Salish Sea is that this is a hotbed of algal diversity. This is due to a few physical factors with regards to our basin. You know, it's it's a really unique basin in that there is a lot of tidal exchange. Any of you that work in the water or play on the water know that, you know, in South Sound, there could be a different tidal difference of 15 feet from low tide to high tide during our spring tides there. Um, and so 
And so this causes a lot of movement of water. And with that water, uh, there is a lot of nutrients. That's why, you know, the, the Puget Sound specifically has been called the Emerald Isles. It's because of all these riverine inputs, you know, before human sediment and all of our wastewater adding to that, we already had a bunch of natural water uh, causing a lot of algal blooms, causing our waters to be green and feeding a lot of our seagrasses as well as our macroalgae. Now, if you're a macroalgae, uh, what's great about this physical uh, setup of the Sailor Sea is that you can just hold on to our rocky shores with your hold fast and sit there and let the currents and tides bring you all the food or nutrients you need. Uh, it's basically an endless buffet of nutrients if you can just hold fast or hold onto a piece of rocky substrate. Um, so that's one of the reasons why our seas, our seasonal seas are so unique in being a hotbed of algal diversity. Uh, one thing, going back to the slide, I wanna shout out, uh, I don't know how many of you out there are aware of this, and I will, I will tell you that my presentation is full of tangents and, and sidebars about interesting science facts. And here's the first one of them. And that's that the term Salish Sea actually uh, originated from the North Sound region, actually originated from Bellingham, uh, Western Washington University, a marine ecologist there by the name of Bert Weber, uh, first coined this term uh, back in 1988. That was a good year. Um, because he did not see that, he saw that, you know, calling things Puget Sound, Strait of Juan de Fuca, Strait of Georgia, you know, because of arbitrary human uh, borders and lines didn't make sense. You know, ecologically, this is one entire basin, the inland sea of the Pacific Northwest. And so he decided to coin the term Salish Sea, honoring the coast Salish people that uh, historically lived here uh, by naming this inland sea and basin after them. So really interesting fact, and again, makes me very proud to be a Western alum. Moving on, uh, oh, here's another great interesting fact about uh, science fact about kelp in our area. For those of you that are, are marine oriented folks, if you are familiar with Ed Ricketts, he is a naturalist, uh, both from this area and as well as Monterey, California, Monterey Bay. Uh, he co-authored this really keystone, you know, guide, uh, ID guide uh, on the Pacific Northwest called Between Pacific Tides. If you go into the library of, of your college and whatnot, they still have it. It's a really great guide, might be outdated now because uh, you know scientists are always changing scientific names. But I just wanted to share that he has a special tie to the Puget Sound, specifically the Olympic Peninsula, which is where I live and is, is a special place. This is actually a picture of Ed Ricketts studying seaweed at near Port Townsend Lighthouse at uh, Kinsey Beach. Um, so just wanted to point out the rich history of marine science and scientists in our area that have done great work, uh, foundational work for, for ecology, marine ecology of the Salish Sea. Um, another really interesting fact is that uh, Ed Ricketts, if you've read Cannery Row or Log from the Sea of Cortez, these great uh, pieces of literature from, from John Steinbeck, you might recognize Ed Ricketts as Doc Ricketts in those books. He was an actual character that, you know, John, John Steinbeck uh, based Doc Ricketts off of. And a lot of those stories are, are real based off, based off of, you know, all the shenanigans Ed Ricketts was doing as he was doing his science up and down our coast. Uh, what's really interesting for me is that the, the, the boat, the Western Flyer, which this book, The Log from the Sea of Cortez, is it was based on, you know, and this is this is totally a factual book where, you know, they wrote this book and cataloged this great expedition to the Sea of Cortez to catalog intertidal organisms. Um, this boat is actually being restored right now in Port Townsend. Uh, this lower right picture is one that I took when I went over there and when I heard the news and wanted to go pay, pay homage to, to that boat because it was such a special book to me and formative in me being a marine biologist. So a lot of great maritime and marine science history in our area. Okay, back to algae. Uh, I, I will talk real quickly about the three uh, groups, three types of macroalgae that, that we can easily categorize them in. And that's really simple. It's based on coloration. We have the green algae, the chlorophytes, the red algae, the rhodophytes, as well as the brown algae, the phaophytes. Now you might think it's really easy based on color, but I can tell you that there are some red algaes that look brown and there are some red, uh, you know, brown algaes that look red or green. So it's not always just based on their superficial color, but um, you know, it, it helps to 
to kind of digging a little deeper with identifying features, which I hope to share with you real quickly now. Uh, going into uh, the group of chorophytes, uh, these are your ovas or green sea lettuce. Uh, that's this is what you're typically going to see the most of in in the North Sound area. You will see this uh, this specimen mostly on the upper end of tidal. Um, not to not to play favorites or anything. Uh, you know, I did mention weedy or nuisance seaweeds earlier. Uh, this tends to be one of the more nuisance seaweeds that is indicative of nutrient loading. So around sites, around shorelines where there's a lot of input of nutrients, maybe someone's leaky septic, you will see abundance of, of sea lettuce. Uh, that's because they just grow faster. You can see that their growth form is really simple as you know, two cell layers thick and it's a sheet. So they're able to utilize their surface area to volume ratio to really suck up all that excess nutrients and bloom. And there are places in the Puget Sound where in the late summer, it gets totally smothered by this ova lactuca or sea lettuce and, and causes some dead zones when, when this stuff uh, dies off and starts degrading and rotting. Um, so this is why I call it a nuisance weed, um, but it is still a native seaweed. Uh, one really interesting, another interesting tidbit, scientific tidbit about this, uh, this is from great research being done at Shannon Point Marine Science Center uh, down in Anacortes uh, from doc Dr. Kathy Van Alstein. Uh, they found that um, uh, sea lettuce uh, produces uh, anti-herbivory compound. So a compound that that causes herbivores not to eat it as much. Uh, and this compound is DMS, dimethosulfo, uh, and it could be DMSO or DMSP, dimethosulfopropanate, or oh, I forgot what DMSO stands for, but it's that low tide smell. If, if you go out uh, to you know a beach and you smell that really sulfurous low tide smell, uh, not the black sulfurous mud, but like somewhat like more algae <laughs> low tide smell, that's what DMS is. And once it gets aerosolized into our atmosphere, it actually is a cloud nucleate, if you can see this. So this is a really cool thing about how, you know, inadvertently these seaweeds producing this anti herbivory compound controls climate around here. They literally control, they, they, you know, if there's enough of this DMSP being released, causes clouds, causes overcast conditions. So really interesting, seaweed controls climate. <laughs> Moving on. We have Eurospira or green barrows. This is this is another green algae that you will typically see around uh, area on beaches where there's freshwater intrusion around uh, mouth of streams and whatnot. Uh, really interesting. The last uh, green or chlorophyte I'm going to talk about is dead man's fingers. You're not going to have any of this in the Bellingham uh, or North Sound area. This is typically found in higher uh, higher energy zones on the coast. I wanted to share this uh, one species or this one specimen because of this interesting fact that this is the largest single cell organism, single cell, largest single cell organism in the world. And so this entire specimen is one cell. Now the caveat is, is this thing does not grow as one cell. Uh, it's a pseudo single cellular organism. So what it does is it grows multiple cells. And then once these new cells develop, they, uh, they fuse their cell walls. So it's composed of multiple cells, but essentially all the cell walls are fused. So it essentially is one cell. Uh, very interesting tidbit. You're welcome. So moving on to uh, another, the next type of macroalgae, the red algae, the rhodophytes. Uh, these are typically your deeper uh, middle to, to subtitle algae. Uh, and, and what I will mention is that if those of you that are familiar with intertidal zonation, you know, the fact that different organisms exist at different depths, I will tell you that macroalgae, kelp and, and seaweed also exhibit intertidal zonation. And they typically are in different depth ranges based on their coloration because the, um, what color they are allows them to uh, absorb light, different mm -hmm. spectrums of light that get filtered out at different depths. I can give you a lot of really complex figures, but basically all you need to know is that they exist in different depths and red algae tend to exist deepest because, um, because red gets filtered out first. That's why it's reflected uh, to our eyes as red. So this means that red algae picks up all other colors besides red. Um, so think more about that, happy to answer questions or not. But diving right into our red algae, uh, 
uh, we have the coarse and fine sea lace. I will also mention that the red algae are typically my favorite ones because they're, they're the laciest and prettiest ones, but they do, uh, they're really hard to identify. And the way you identify them is to look at the growing tip. So this is uh, microcladia and the Latin name microcladia means small claws or small hands. And if you look at the growing tip, they look like little small hands. Um, and in contrast, the next specimen I have here is pocanium or sea comb. And you'll see that all of the branches or all of the branching uh, comes off of one side of, of the terminal br uh, branches, like right here. So it's a comb, a sea comb. Uh, that's kind of how I remember them. Uh, we have various sea brushes. We have three species, three or four species of Odonthalia. Um, their, distinct, uh, their distinctive characteristic is this little spur that comes out um, on, on each sides. Um, I encourage you to pick up a guide um, See, I don't have one to show, but pick up a guide um, and go out in the field and check these out. They're really beautiful. Again, the reds you're only going to be able to see to uh, at really low tides. Um, here is a Turkish washcloth, uh, Master Carpus. You'll see this on, on rocks in the mid to upper tide, uh, inner tidal. Did, did I have a question? Nope, I'm going to keep going then. Next, we have the Turkish towel. Uh, which is a bigger version of the Tur Tur bigger version of the Turkish washcloth, but this Chondrocanthus Turkish towel is is really big, and some of you would probably definitely recognize this on the beach. This reminds me that when you're looking at algae on the beach, especially things that are washed up, just know that some of it will be degraded. You will find some of this Turkish towel uh, bleached out, so all of its uh, you know. Uh, color pigments have bleach and you'll see this completely white or clear. Uh, so when you're going to ID uh, submerged aquatic vegetation, you have to take into account the life stage that they're in. And you also have to take into account any other factors like bleaching and things like that. Um, this is one that a lot of people will recognize. This is uh, the splendid iridescent seaweed or Maziella splendens. Uh, one really interesting thing is that it's only iridescent underwater or when, this, when the surface of this algae is wet because that iridescence is caused by refraction of light because of, uh, you know, the cellular structure on this, on this uh, seaweed. So I've tried to press this before and once it's dry, I can tell you it's not as pretty and it's not iridescent. Um, next, we have uh, Sper Sperlingia or the red eyelet silk seaweed. You might recognize this by its shotgun pattern. Some other people call it the shotgun kelp, shotgun wheat, uh, seaweed. There actually is a shotgun kelp, not, not to be confused with this, but that is a brown or phaophyte. Um, last but not least, and this is the one red algae that I think is the most common throughout the Puget Sound, especially in the North Sound. This is sea spaghetti or Salcodeo theca gaudi chaudii. Um, it used to be Gracilaria again. These names always keep changing. Um, so go with its common name, sea spaghetti, and you will see this washed up on the shore um, and at mid to lower tides. And again, this is the most common one uh, throughout the Puget Sound or Sailor Sea, most common red algae. So moving on into a brown algae now, this is where I get really excited because we're gonna start talking about some really complex habitat forming algae and, and kelp. Um, Brown algae are called phaophytes uh, based on their, their pigments. Uh, a lot of you will be familiar with rockweed. This is pretty ubiquitous uh, throughout the world and you definitely will find this on rocky areas in, in Bellingham Bay and the North Sound area. <clears throat> Next we have uh, the two acid weeds des of the genus Desmarestia. This is Desmarestia linguata, really beautiful uh, brown algae, but I specifically point this one and this next one, uh, witch's hair, which is a, uh, um, a noodle or, or a uh, longer version, not, you know, not the flattened version of the acid weed. This is the basically hairy version of the uh, acid weed, Desmarestia. Both of these, again, are within the genus Desmarestia. I consider them both acid weed because they produce acids as their anti-herbivory compounds. These ones I tend to find throughout the summer uh, not being munched on by many herbivores because they are acidic, uh, or maybe except by me when I want to taste them. Uh, and I encourage you to try this if you can find a clean sample. If you taste it, you'll note that it tastes like lemons. They're acidic. Um, and, and that's what 
that acidity causes it to taste really sour. Um, I also make a special note to point these out because I, I, I do algae pressings and I, mm -hmm. I teach algae pressing workshops. And I specifically tell my participants, my students to separate these acid weeds from all your other collections. Because uh, as you can imagine, the acid will bleach all everything else out in your collections. Um, so with that, question? Yeah, I have a question. Um, can you give examples of some herbivores? Herbivores, yes. Uh, uh, there is a really cute little isopod. It almost looks like a little pill bug. I'm trying to remember its name, but there, there are these little isopods that crawl around. And I'm not talking about amphipods, which are can compress, uh, you know, uh, laterally. I'm talking about an isopod that's compressed uh, dorsal ventrally, like a pill bug, but they have longer legs. They crawl around all this um, kelp and whatnot, and and that's one common herbivore. In fact, they create a really cool little cocoon. They would just like a caterpillar will cut the edge of a kelp pond and then fold one edge over to make a little tube cocoon that they 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 hang out in. So there is a little <clears throat> marine isopod. The genus name starts with an I. Uh, various marine snails will be herbivores, uh, all the way up to you know, you know like me or you know humans. Uh, you know, uh, brants, uh, various, various, you know, uh, avian, you know, uh, uh, birds, other wildlife, you definitely, you know, uh, at low tides, sometimes you'll see deer come down, come down and eat kelp so they can get their, their trace minerals and iodine and whatnot in their bodies. Uh, so almost everything eats uh, kelp and seaweeds. And one thing I will say as a forager and whatnot myself, which I won't go into too much about collections here today, is that um, there, there, there's no seaweed or kelp that is poisonous. You know, there, there might be some that's not as palatable and might taste uh, bitter, but it's all edible for the most part. Um, all right. So speaking of edibility, I will tell you that most of the things in this order, laminariales, which is kelp, which are the kelps, uh, are edible and they're, they're the select edibles. Um, they are the, you know, mo typically the ones that are cultivated and harvested the most for human consumption and use. And they are the ones that taste the best. This is a really cool little drawing that I found in my office pr from one of my predecessors of the kelps and brown seaweeds of Puget Sound, just absolutely beautiful. Um, going on a quick tangent uh, of cool science facts, of why laminary ailes or kelps are, na are named laminarians. Uh, that's because they produce these sculpting patterns on their surface that, um, as you can see uh, with this research and other research that's been done, uh, the different uh, patterns on their blades correspond to their plasticity or their ability to change their morphology based on different environmental factors. So in uh, protected bays and areas where there's not a lot of water exchange, you'll see that these uh, specimens, these kelp grow a lot of ripples on their surface area. And these ripples basically break up the boundary layer of water that flows over their, their surface area. And this maximizes exchange, gas and nutrient exchange with the water around them. Um, whereas in areas where there's high current and uh, high wave action, they grow flat, their blades grow flat. And that reduces friction and that, uh, you know, reduces the, their, their odds of getting ripped up by the currents and, and, and wave action. So really interesting, but it's this, this factor, this, this specific plasticity that causes them to develop uh, wavy sculpting patterns on their surface areas that breaks up the laminar flow of water against them that gave them their names laminarians. Another really cool science fact. So real quickly, before I go into the various different types of kelps, I want to talk about their morphology real quick. Um, unlike seagrasses, uh, and, and I didn't talk about the morphology of a lot of the seaweed before because they're relatively simple and they're, they're post-straight or they're just, you know, encrusting on or, or pretty small bushes on the bottom, whereas kelp gets starts to get really complex and they do have some specialized, uh, specialized, um, components that is, is not as derived as true plants or vascularized as seagrasses, but they do have things that are analogous. Uh, these are the proto roots, you know, the holdfasts 
uh, which is some of you might have seen uh, washed up on a beach. It's this kind of bird's nest or tango of, of what looks like root structures. Uh, the only difference is they're not vascularized. You know, they perform the same gas exchange as, as everything everywhere else on the kelp. Whereas, you know, uh, in true plants like seagrasses, the, you know, nutrient exchange is very localized in the roots. That's kind of one of the difference. The hold fast is, is a proto root system. Its only purpose is to hold the kelp there. It doesn't take up nutrients any more than the rest of the kelp. Uh, it has a stipe, which is basically the, the trunk of the trunk of the specimen. And then some of them have pneumatocysts. And as you can tell by the name, these are air cells. These are air bladders that help lift the uh, kelp up above uh, other other uh, submerged aquatic vegetation that it might be uh, competing with for sunlight. And then of course the blade is, is the, the leaves or the fawns of the, of the kelp. Uh, kelp and seaweed typically, sorry about that, kelp and seaweed typically only grow on rocky substrate. Uh, that's because they, they have this holdfast that they need to, to grab onto um, the rocky bottom with, and they don't have any other uh, really good mechanism to hold on to sandy bottoms. So if you see some kelp on, on a sandy bottom, I bet you if you brushed away the, the sand, right under a thin layer of sand, there will be rocks there. Um, the other thing I wanna point out real quickly is the different growth habits of kelp. Uh, again, as I mentioned, some kelp, uh, not kelp, growth habits of kelp and seaweed. Some are encrusting, uh, some are what we call pro prostrate, which is most seaweed, they just grow off the bottom and they flop around in the current. Some are stipitate and have a stipe to hold them up a little bit taller, like the kelp in my background here, if, if you're still seeing me. Um, and then some are canopy forming kelp. They have pneumatocysts that gets them all the way to the surface um, to, to really uh, outcompete everything else on the bottom. Here's a good uh, visual diagram of the different growth habits of kelp. You have prostrate, all these things that are grown on the bottom, like this sugar rack, you have precipitate kelp, like this Caragarafa stipe kelp here. And then you have these floating kelp, like our iconic Neurocystis obo kelp. Uh, as far as its life history, again, this is macroalgae's life history. It, it applies not only for kelp, but all, all macroalgae. They produce spores through what are known as uh, sorus. And these spores find, find each other in, in the water column, produce this, uh, this proto kelp organism uh, that, that crawls around before it grows uh, a sporophyte and in, in back into a kelp. Uh, not going to get into alternation of generation here, but if you're if you know a little bit about plant um, plant reproduction, uh, the the kelp form or the seagrass or macro seaweed or macroalgae form of it is it just delays the uh, the sporoph life stage um, is, is uh, free living. It, it creates this microscopic uh, proto kelp that crawls around for the perfect spot before it grows this sporophyte. Sorry, when I said spor sporophytic life stage, I meant gametophytic. I'm getting way too much in the weeds of science here. Sorry about that. Uh, so stepping back, I'll, I'll just show that if you see bow kelp with these little patches on, on the terminus of their blades, these are, these are spore patches. These are the sorus. Um, two other cool things about their life history I'll point out is that kelp grow really fast because they're not very specialized in vascularization and other uh, you know, morphological features. They just grow really fast. I mean, I think some of the stats are they can grow up to a foot or a meter, something like that, a year. I think some of the giant kelp off California's coast can definitely grow up about a meter a year very fast. Some are, some of them, the seaweeds are perennials, but the big kelp, uh, like Neriocystis, giant kelp, those are all annuals. So they all die back in the winter and they, they, they recruit again in the spring. And, and this entire whip, bow whip of the kelp grows in one growing season in, over the course of the summer. So moving on here, I'm going to go through some of the common uh, laminarians of kelp in our area and I, their identifying features. This is sugar rack. Um, take one guess at why it's called sugar rack. Tastes pretty darn good. Uh, Saccharina latissima, 
these are the different growth forms of it. As you can see, this one was probably taken on, this one on the upper left, probably taken from high energy environment because it doesn't have many of the wavy uh, scoping patterns. Whereas these other ones are probably from low energy environments. Again, this is what gives them their name. They're the laminarians. Uh, it's that growth habit. Next, we have the wing kelp, Alaria marginata. This is a, this is iconic based, uh, this is uh, identified based on the midrib, but the key feature are these wings on the bottom here. And in this wing kelp, these wings are the saurus. These are the reproductive blades down here. We have Costuria, Costurata, five ribbed kelp. I'm sorry, I'm saying their scientific names so quick, they kind of just roll off the tongue. Um, but this is another really well known one around here. Um, I will I will tell you that the sugar rack is probably the most common one throughout the Sailor Sea and one that you will most likely find easily in the subtitle or lower intertidal in, in the North Sound area. In higher energy areas, we have the feather boa or egregia. This, this uh, species have these little pneumatices, little olive sized pneumatices that helps it get out of, uh, get above uh, all the other uh, vegetation. So this will float to the surface when it's inundated. Next, we are going into our stipitate kelp. So thinking about the growth habits, these are the kelp that stick themselves up with this uh, a robust uh, woody stipe. This is Caragrapha. Note the growth patterns of the blades versus Laminaria uh, cinchillia. Um, this is another stipe kelp, but you note know how it differs, the blades grow between this one and the last one. Um, so this is our bull kelp, Neurocystis luciana, the most iconic kelp in our region. This is the one that, that is most widespread as far as canopy kelp in our area. If we had a vote, I would vote for this to be our state kelp, our state seaweed. But we also have the very charismatic uh, giant kelp, Macrocystis porphyra, porifera. Um, this one you see a lot uh, down in California, Oregon. You only really get this on our high energy coastlines. So you're not gonna see this in the North Sound area. You, you will see this in the Strait of Juan de Fuca in the coast of Washington, but a beautiful three-dimensional kelp. Uh, and not only that, it has, it has blades throughout the water column. So it creates a lot more habitat and complexity. Uh, very special and beautiful. One interesting thing I'll point out is how it grows and, and splits. Uh, it's one of the reasons why I do algae pressings is to capture you know, a specific life stage of these, these uh, vegetation uh, in its development. And if you look here, this terminal blade is what's called a scimitar blade. A scimitar is a Middle Eastern uh, sword that curves. Um, and so this blade is curved like a scimitar. And what happens is, uh, as new as it grows, the older blades break off like a conveyor belt off of the scimitar blade. So you can see that in process here, coming off of that one blade. Really interesting. Um, last but not least, we have Postelsia, one of my favorite kelps. This is the sea palm. Again, sorry to tease uh, our folks in North Sound. This you're only going to get on the coast in the highest energy environment, but absolutely beautiful specimen. Um, the only other one I will show now is the Japanese kelp wakame, uh, anadaria. And I want to share this because this is invasive. It has not arrived here in the Puget Sound, St. Louis Sea region, but it has arrived down in California and San Diego where they've spent millions of dollars trying to eradicate it. Um, so I just want to show you all what it looks like. Note the midrip, but then note how these side fronds come out. If you see it, please report it to somebody. You know, feel free to have my contact information after this report it to me. I'll make sure it gets to the right people. Um, yeah, this is kind of on a lookout list. So taking a step back from our various uh, specimens and identification uh, and talking about real, real quickly to uh, talking about kelp status distribution and trends. This is a map from uh, Department of Natural Resources near shore program showing where our floating kelp and understory kelp are distributed throughout our state. Um, what I can tell you is that if you compare this with the eelgrass map, you'll see that kelp is basically everywhere eelgrass is not. Uh, that's because the eelgrass showed where there is soft uh, sandy substrate. This is where this is showing where there's hard substrate because like I said, sea seaweeds and kelp uh, grow on hard substrate. So that's kind of what it, this is shown here, it's distribution. 
Um, this is just another figure of that. This is a more recent map. Uh, Department of Natural Resources does surveys every, you know, between two to five years to do an inventory of uh, a submerged aquatic vegetation. This map is uh, located here on the uh, Ecology's Coastal Atlas. Anybody can access this. Really cool uh, information and science there. Uh, one thing that I want to talk a little bit about is kelp distribution in the Salish Sea and, that and how that has changed over the past century. There is, there is some really great research being done at the Department of Natural Resource by a scientist named Helen Berry um, comparing old historical maps. This map is from 1918, uh, where they have mapped uh, previously where um, kelp was over a century ago, and this was a Department of Agriculture or Department of Commerce effort to, to map kelp in order to, to, uh, to extract iodine or potash for the war efforts back when. Um, so this literally was some guy rowing the sound in his boat and mapping where kelp is. But what the scientists have done is compare this map to current distributions. Uh, and so if you go to this link uh, at the Department of Natural Resources website, you can actually grab this uh, grab this and scroll back and forth and look at it and how look at how it's changed over the last hundred years. Really cool. Um, encourage you to check that out. Uh, this is based on a publication that came out, a uh, scientific publication that came out in 2019 that showed that for the most part, kelp is canopy kelp is stable in the Strait of Juan de Fuca with the exception of the Eastern Strait, east of uh, Dungeness Spit where they have observed declines, uh, declines in kelp. Uh, what more is that, oh, sorry, what more is that hot off the press? This is as of February 17th of this year, the, the latest addition to that scientific literature uh, comparing uh, kelp distribution from 100 years ago to the present in self sound shows that there has been a significant decline of kelp, this canopy kelp in our self sound region. So I encourage you to check this out. They, there was a cool, uh, NPR KUOW piece about this. This is in PLOS One Scientific uh, uh, Journal. This is Helen Berry looking at some kelp. Um, and what I'll have to say is she is actually working on a similar publication, the companion literature for North Sound. They're doing an analysis now. And so in the next year or two, I'm expecting a similar paper to come out about North Sound. And I'm really interested to see that because there is definitely a lot of kelp historically around the San Juans and still is. But um, yeah, I like to know what's going on around Bellingham Bay, you know, uh, Chuckanut Ridge area, Lummi Island, those are all very kelpy areas that should have a lot of kelp. Um, so real quickly, threats to kelp, very similar to uh, threats to eelgrass, you know, development, sedimentation, nutrients, you know, this is, this is a figure that shows, you know, both a smothering, uh, smothering of kelp by weedy, uh, seaweeds, but also they're experiencing a lot of predation by kelp crab, Pugita producta. These kelp crab can actually demolish entire kelp forests. Um, there's a lot of talk about uh, sea urchins. Uh, there, there's a lot of attention of sea urchins in, in California and Oregon. And, and for those of you that are familiar, you know, we used to have a lot of sea otters in our area, which were hunted to local extin extinction, uh, you know, um, back in the 1800s. And sea, or, sea otters were the primary predator of sea urchins. And without this uh, pr predation pressure, sea urchin populations have bloomed and, and exploded and on our coasts. Uh, and they are creating what are known as these kelp barrens, as you can see on the bottom left figure. They are demolishing entire kelp forests because uh, sea urchins are one of the uh, razors of kelp. One thing that I really, really need to know at this point is that the research shows this is happening in, in, um, in parts of California, in parts of coastal BC, outside of the Salish Sea, North BC, and in parts of Oregon. But the research, the jury is still out in Washington state. And I wanna make that very clear because there is a lot of, you know, renegade citizen scientists out there that wanna go out and start smashing urchins. And I will caution that not only is that illegal, um, it, it's not proven, you know, the, this, this trophic or food web cascade has not been proven in Washington state waters yet. Uh, a lot of where the kelp has declined itself down does not have sea urchins. And the one sea urchin species that is the problematic one is the purple urchin, uh, Strombus purpuratus, um, I believe. But that's not, 
there is no overlap right now of where kelp is declining in Washington and where urchin populations are. So I just, you know, caution people uh, uh, over taking signs from another state, another region and applying it here where the Salish Sea is very unique, all right? Um, I can tell you the bigger threat to kelp and seagrass in the Puget Sound is nutrients. We really need to get on our wastewater controls and management throughout the state. Um, so that's, that's the only thing I'll say there. Uh, some examples of how kelp, uh, healthy kelp forests are impacted by various processes. So on the left column, you have examples of healthy kelp forests. In the middle column, you have physical factors such as uh, sedimentation from development, from stormwater, whatnot, smothering, smothering these kelp. And then you have biological factors on the right column, uh, such as uh, loss of uh, predators. So you know, on the upper one, it's a reef that's lost sharks. So now you have all these herbivorous fish. Or oh, similar to here, it's, it's an area that's lost a top predator, sea otters, not here, but on our, uh, on uh, Pacific coast, you know, it's lost sea otters. And so there's an increase in urchins grazing here uh, in the middle row and on the far right column is indicative of uh, high nutrients. This is getting smothered by epiphytic uh, algae. And the last one is, is uh, parasites and disease, biological factors. Um, did I see a question? Nope. Okay. Well, I'll keep going. One again, what I'll say is that those weedy or nuisance species of seaweed tend to be able to grow faster, and because the, the merely due to the fact that they're able to grow faster, they can outcompete uh, the more robust kelp, the more complex habitat form in kelp, and so it causes conditions like this where it's just tufts of algae rather than complex. Uh, complex uh, kelp forests. And this has been shown in other areas in the world uh, where there's a lot of sedimentation and, and nutrient uh, pollution. Uh, but the good thing is, this is also something that, um, you know, people in our state are aware of. There are these various groups that's come together uh, over the last couple of years. I was fortunate to get enough again to participate in this process uh, where they came up with a conservation and recovery plan. So there is active work in our state for kelp restoration. And I can tell you that I personally was involved in permitting the first experimental kelp farm or restoration site uh, in Kitsap County. And this is a buddy of mine who works at Puget Sound Restoration Fund, um, holding up all of the product of their growth. And, and I don't even think they see that this line is self-recruited. So, so the one thing about restoration, environmental restoration, that I, I can say from all my experience is that, um, you know, nature is resilient, is resilient. And if we just get out of the way and, get, you know, give it a chance, it will come back. Now I want to take a step back and um, let me do a quick time check. Okay, doing pretty good. I'm gonna wrap this up real quick here. Um, take a step back and think of all submerged aquatic vegetation as one ecological unit. So I'm gonna talk about seagrasses, seaweed and kelp all as one unit because they have similar ecologies. And you know what, in our marine environment, they have similar functions. So these are the different ecological functions of submerged aquatic vegetation. Uh, you know, fundamentally, these are plants. So just like our land plants, they are responsible for primary production. You know, they are converting inorganic energy in the form of sunlight into organic nutrients and energy uh, that can be consumed by, uh, by grazers, herbivores, and, and passed on up the food web. Uh, they are responsible for nutrient cycling, taking trace minerals and nutrients and putting it into organic form that can be consumed. And they generate oxygen, right? Just like all, all land plants, they are responsible for oxygenating the environment. Uh, just like our terrestrial forests, kelp and seagrasses are responsible for habitat formation. You can imagine our near shore would be pretty boring uh, if it were not for the fact that we have these complex plants creating a lot of nooks and crannies for different uh, huge diversity of life to live in. Uh, more recently with climate change and whatnot, there's a lot of focus on their ability to fix carbon, to take inorganic carbon, CO2, and put it into the ground as organic carbon. Uh, their ecosystem engineers, which is another term for creating habitat. Um, and, and as far as humans go, you know, maybe not as much here in Washington state, but in other states where there are storms and whatnot, like in the south, uh, these marine vegetation is really important in buffering storm energy and wave, wave attenuation and erosion on shorelines. And, and to a lesser extent, seagrasses do, do uh, you know, cease erosion. Um, 
This is just a figure I like to show because it was produced by uh, Potanza Marine Science Center where I volunteer. Um, this just shows the, the diversity of life that lives in and around um, eelgrass meadows and, and utilize eelgrass meadows for, for their livelihood. Very beautiful. Uh, one thing that I will note is because of the eelgrass living in soft substrate and their ability to, to take root and, and create, uh, basically alterate the, the bottom structures, they aerate the substrate and, and there are diverse bottom in funnel communities associated with seagrass. And it's these in funnel communities that uh, a lot of great blue herons and uh, as well as brants uh, seasonally come up here to feed, uh, well, to feed on these organisms as well as the grass, the brants, I, I'm misspeaking here, the brants actually are eating the grass itself. And before we hunted them to, uh, you know, extinction, we actually have dugons, stellar dugons here that fed on sea, marine vegetation such as kelp and seagrasses. Here is another nice figure that shows the diversity of life associated with kelp forests. I can tell you this is something probably from California based on the life there, but it doesn't distract from the fact that um, it's really complex. These are forests and like all forests, there is a lot of complexity that allows a lot of different organisms to live in, a lot of different niches for organisms to fill. Um, so hopefully this, is, this video will also kind of show you um, what it's like to be in one of these kelp forests. Um, I, will, I will tell you that one of the reasons that I'm really interested in marine vegetation, not only am I a marine scientist, a biologist, I, I'm a stakeholder. I spend a lot of my free time in, in kelp forests. Uh, I, do, I do a lot of photography, snorkeling and spear fishing. And so, you know, I just, just really love being in these habitats and think they're, they're great and worth knowing about, worth uh, being passionate about and protecting. Uh, so there's one video. Here's another one. This is near deception pass under high currents. Just absolutely beautiful seeing uh, seeing these videos. Um, <clears throat> seeing a kelp in current. And right here, I'm kicking as hard as I can against that current. And here is an example of how you know different organisms use this kelp as habitat. This is a school of forage fish, juvenile forage fish that is hanging out around a the kelp. They're not strain far from the kelp because they're using it as cover. That was an urchin down there, red urchin. I think coming up, you're gonna see uh, an anemone, plumose anemone on the bottom here. So very diverse with some sea urchins. All right, I'm gonna skip on to the next slide. Just some beautiful art that shows, uh, you know, other very important species utilizing our kelp beds. If you are a fisherman, you might know that, you know, during salmon season, it's nice to troll right outside the kelp beds because that's where that's where a lot of the salmon are, are. And, you know, actually they're natural predators, southern resident killer whales or other killer whales also know this fact. And you can see a picture of them forging in their own kelp bed here. I always think about this when I'm out there snorkeling by myself or with friends. Very interesting. There actually was a really cool video from California where they put a camera on the back of a great white. And it was the first video showing great white foraging and hunting actively in a kelp bed. Something else that I also think about when I'm out there. Um, like I said, kelp and seagrasses are vegetation. Not only are they responsible for you know putting oxygen into, a, into the water and atmosphere, they, they produce biomass, organic biomass that is consumed in the food web. Uh, so a lot of this becomes particulate organic matter that is fed on by bacteria and, and utilized by filter feeders. Some of it get uh, washed up on the beach as rack and eaten by deers or taken up by humans to be, uh, to be um, fertilizer. So it, it influences terrestrial environments too. Uh, in the sound, what's really important is that it acts as a spawning substrate for herring. And this is actually a picture I took of my buddy Rory, also with the department. Uh, we were doing herring surveys and you can see, you know, kelp and seagrass is used as a spawning substrate for these important forage fish that feed salmon, uh, killer whales and, and us. Last but not least, well, coming to the end here, I've combined both the layers on this coastal atlas of seagrass and kelp. And what you can see here is between seagrasses or eelgrass and kelp, 
there basically is a contiguous intertidal migratory corridor, or what I like to call a highway for juvenile salmon out migrating from their river, NATO rivers as they out migrate to sea, they are migrating through this intertidal highway of vegetation. I can guarantee you that they are not swimming in deep open water because that's where the predators are. They are darting from kelp, kelp bed to kelp bed to seagrass patch to seagrass patch, utilizing this near shore vegetation as cover as they migrate out to sea. So really important for, for salmon a species that's endangered and uh, is, uh, you know, something we're trying to recover. Uh, last, last couple of interesting tidbits, uh, kelp has been shown, uh, kelp rack or these flotsams of floating racks of kelp has been shown as a mechanism of rockfish dispersal. If you are a deep water rockfish, pinnacles under, underwater and whatnot, for the most part, act as islands. So when you think about it, it's basically separated islands throughout the Puget Sound, different population, uh, genetically distinct populations of kelp, uh, of rockfish throughout Washington. But when um, these kelp racks get washed up, their juveniles uh, go, go with the kelp racks. And so this is a mechanism of genetic exchange be between deep water reefs of reef fish, really interesting. And all the meanwhile, the kelp pro pro provides food and cover for the, for the juvenile fish that are migrating with these racks floating along. Like I said, there's a lot of interest in blue carbon. Again, that is basically just the term used for uh, these aquatic vegetation to, to uh, act as carbon sinks or carbon sequesters. Um, in fact, right now, there's a lot of talk about kelp commercial farming and the most uh, financially or economic feasible portion of that is not for human consumption or commercial use of that kelp, but is actually of selling carbon credits with that kelp. So it's a big thing. It's going to get bigger and hopefully we're going to be able to utilize these, you know, natural uh, carbon sequesters, these plants to help us uh, ameliorate and, and offset the effects of climate change. Uh, last, this is really the last one. Last but not least, kelp might have played a role in the evolution of humans. This is one of the leading hypotheses of how humans got to North America uh, from Asia. Uh, there's the land bridge hypothesis where they could, and, and honestly, well, I'm not a paleontologist or scientist. It probably, there probably were groups of human that took ver these various routes. But one of the routes that were taken was this coastal highway. As you can imagine back um, during the last ice age, uh, um, sea levels were much lower because all the water was locked up. And there was uh, this coastal highway that indigenous people were able to, to row their vessels, canoes, uh, you know, um, along uh, the coastline of Asia all the way to North America. And in the meanwhile, they were protected by these kelp forests from storms. They're, they're not going offshore and across the ocean. They're staying near shore and they're, they're puddle jumping from island to island, utilizing the kelp forests as their guide. And not only that, during this migration, they were able to feed and utilize the uh, organisms as well as the kelp that 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 formed this highway and this this has been proven with various uh, fossils and, and bones in their diet uh, and whatnot but um, really interesting last fact about kelp with that I'm gonna thank you all for your for your participation and attention today um, by and I also want to thank North Sound stewards uh, welcome MRC and restore uh, to re resources uh, for providing me this opportunity to come, come talk to you all in North Sound. Uh, this slide, as you can tell, is from my usual presentation to Jefferson and Kitsap County, but I will plug that uh, Whatcom County also has a Marine Resources Committee on which you can get involved in, and Northwest Straits, which is the parent organization of the Marine Resources Committee, uh, does citizen science kelp uh, monitoring surveys. So I do that on my Jefferson Marine Resources Committee, and I encourage you if you want to get get uh, involved to to participate on these local in these local organizations. Uh, last but last, I'm going to share some kelp pressings, but I'm open for any uh, questions at this point. If there are any questions, go ahead and put them in the chat, or turn off your or turn on your mic, and you can ask them. question yeah go ahead um if the sea urchins take over what are they going to do are they going to try and control the population or are there any plans for that 
Yeah, and so so I'll I'll say again that has has not been shown here yet. Um, and I, although they're looking for it, I can tell you personally, I've been in touch with the sea urchin manager uh, uh, with Washington Department of Fish and Wildlife, and they are actively looking for urchin barons and taking uh, taking information from from free divers and people in the community. Uh, so we're looking for it. It hasn't been documented here yet, but I imagine if it does become the issue here, uh, there are a lot of efforts down in California and Oregon where there are where those departments and those uh, the citizen scientists there are. are, are doing various things to eradicate the problematic sea urchin. And I imagine those would be good models of what we can do here. Yeah, we have another question from Rachel. What are your views about the potential environmental benefits and dangers of kelp farming? Uh, yeah, so, so there are definitely benefits to kelp farming, uh, especially if it's used in, uh, uh, in co um, in combination with other types of aquaculture, create to create this kind of whole picture, uh, you, you know, this whole ecosystem um, uh, type of aquaculture, you know, uh, especially fish farming. Uh, not that we should be doing fish pens or anything in, in the first place, but we do have some fish pens for for salmon, for native salmon. They they are kept in some fish pens for 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 a short while to develop their homing sense, homing sense and whatnot. You know, those produce a lot of waste and and usually causes dead zones below them. And so if you utilize kelp there to help uh, soak up some of those nutrients and could, uh, you know, produce a product that is, that can be used by other, you know, organisms or commercially or just bury to uh, bury the carbon, that, that's a good way to do it. But uh, there are definitely a lot of concerns and, and this kelp aquaculture is something that the state is actively right now, as of last week, I sat in on a workshop. We're trying to figure this out because uh, there is not a framework of how it's going to be permanent and regulated. Um, and there are undoubtedly both benefits and impacts. And these are things that we are studying to try to figure it out. I generally am in favor of kelp uh, farming for, for the sole reason of restoration. Uh, and, and mostly because I don't like people going out and collecting natural kelp and decimating habitats and whatnot. There are very specific rules for how you collect seaweed and kelp. And if you're interested, I'm happy to share that. But, um, you know, everything has its extremes, you know, if you're putting a kelp farm somewhere where it ought to not be, you can, you can have impacts that would be against that. So it really depends on this context of each individual situation, but generally I'm in favor. All right, we have another question. Are there any significant impacts on local uh, aquaculture from region, from recreational near shore slash surf zone use? What was that last bit? Recreation near shore and um, yeah, are there any significant impacts on local aquaculture from recreational near shore slash surf zone use? Hmm, is that in the chat? It is in the chat. Yes. Let me take a look. Yeah. Surf zone use. Any significant um, local recreation, um, local aquaculture? Hmm. I, I I guess I don't understand that question quite. Uh, I, I I might not be understanding the question. Impacts from on aquaculture? I wouldn't think so. Um, typically, a lot of uh, commercial aquaculture are, are um, a lot of commercial aquaculture are in private air shorelines and whatnot where there's no access for, for public and recreation use. So, so basically, it's kind of mutually exclusive due to property ownership. Um, so no surfers are not help, uh, are hurt are not hurting the kelp at all. In fact, they're you know speaking of surfing, with, of which I'm an avid surfer, or uh, surf rider organizations, you know, have done tremendously great work with other um, other you know environmental groups to to help protect our marine resources it, because protecting our resources all go hand in hand in protecting our, our recreational use and access of our shorelines. Um, so you know. There, there is a good overlap there um, in, appreci in appreciation and love of the ocean, so. Yeah, we have another question. What resources would you suggest for responsibly foraging seaweed and algae? Oh, great question. Uh, well, first and foremost, definitely make sure you read up on the rules from the Department of Fish and Wildlife and you have an active shellfish and seaweed license. Uh, but also make sure you go to check a Department of Natural Resources website. And in fact, I'm gonna switch my, I'm gonna, switch to the next slide because this is directly from the Department of Natural Resource. Um, what I will say in general 
Okay, so so the figure on top is from Nat Department of Natural Resource, and the and the little insert from the bottom on the bottom is from Fish and Wildlife. Basically, you don't want to cut um, where the hold fast is, where it grows, right? If you cut the blade, it will regenerate, like you see in these figures. But if you tear it up from the hold fast, it's not going to come back uh, the individual specimen. Um, so just harvest responsibly, uh, and only take what you need. Uh, the other thing I will I will I will say is you might have seen in some of my pressings it has the hold fast. I will tell you that these are ones that have washed up on the beach. So I'm not ripping these up by the hold fast. These are ones that have just washed up on the beach, and um, I I took advantage of ones that would otherwise be be decomposing. All right, we have um, a question. Let's go ahead and make this our last question. If you have any more, you can go ahead and email Nam. I'll make sure to get that out to everybody. Um, do you have any suggestions for people trying seriously to get involved in kelp restoration and conservation aquaculture? Yeah, um, it, it's it's really hard right now. Uh, I, I think somebody asked, I saw somebody ask that on a Facebook group the other day. It's so new in our state that the regulators are still trying to figure it out. So unless you already are participating in shellfish or any kind of other aquaculture that you can piggyback your kelp aquaculture onto that kind of permitting, that's kind of what they're doing right now. It's, it's basically impossible for someone that doesn't have the experience or background or infrastructure to do it. Uh, the best thing to do is support the organization that are, that are uh, actively participating in the process of, of basically trailblazing how this is going to work in the sound. That includes Peter Sound Restoration Fund that I mentioned. Um, there are ways to get involved with them, either as a volunteer or donor and whatnot, uh, as well as any of the Northwest Straits Commission or Foundation organizations, which include Whatcom MRC. Uh, there are seven marine resources committee throughout the Puget Sound in the, in the uh, less populous counties. So King County doesn't have one, Pierce County doesn't have one, but Snohomish County does, Whatcom County, San Juan County, Island County, Jefferson County, um, Kitsap County doesn't have one. But those are organizations where you can participate as a citizen scientist in uh, kelp monitoring, kayak monitoring. So that's one way to get involved. Uh, you can also support the parent foundation, uh, Northwest Straits, uh, in general. But at this point, there are not too many opportunities yet, and I hope there will be soon. Okay, all right. Thank you, everybody, for those great questions, and thank you, Nam, for this presentation. This was very thorough. I always learn a lot every time I am a part of these presentations, so thank you. And for those who joined um, midway through the presentation, these are going to be recorded, um, and they'll be uploaded to Resources YouTube channel, specifically the North Sound Stewards page. So if you missed any part of the presentation, you can go ahead and search for the video. It should be up um, uploaded by tomorrow. But yeah, thank you again, Nam, for joining us. And thank you, everybody. Um, make sure that if you are a North Sound Stewards that you are logging your hours and track it forward. Go ahead and do it now before you forget. Um, and yeah, thank you so much. You guys all have a wonderful evening. Thanks, everyone. Take care.